the West and President Zelensky have lost their minds and become detached from reality. You know, we've, we've been saying stuff like that on this show for a while, and we, we show some clips here and there, but I, I just can't help but get to the point to where I think there must be something I'm missing because so many learned and experienced people can't be making such elementary mistakes, which have potentially catastrophic results. I keep thinking that, but yet every time I look at the ground and look at the actual evidence, I can't come to a different uh, conclusion about that. The facts scream what this, the thesis that we're talking about here today. And I'm so grateful to have in the foxhole with me another Army veteran. Uh, you know him. He's always here a lot. Professor John Mearsheimer, professor at the University of Chicago, international relations theorist extraordinaire. And uh, man, I'm glad to have you back on today, John, because I need some help to figure some of this nonsense out. Glad to be here, Danny. Well, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really have to provide too much proof that, that we've kind of lost our minds here. But uh, as you and I were chatting just before we came on the air, uh, it, it sometimes it does make you wonder, what planet are we living on, it, it, living in? Because these things, it, it's hard to see how they could be. How can so many people, as I said a second ago, John, who, who have elevated, who spent decades of time in international relations, have, have you know, been in the diplomatic trenches, how do you think that just generally speaking, we get to the point to where we make such bad choices? It's just very hard to say. Uh, I mean, one could argue that we're just so deeply committed now to this war, and that would include us in the West, especially the United States, uh, but also the Ukrainian government, the Zelensky government, uh, that there's just no turning around, that they're going to continue hoping for a miracle. Another possible explanation that I think about is that because it's a war of attrition and it does not involve a lot of movement on the ground, what really matters in this war are the exchange ratios, the kill ratios um, uh, between the uh, Russians on one side and the Ukrainians on the other. Uh, but it's hard to see who's winning that from afar. Uh, and because there's not a lot of movement on the ground and people identify success with movement on the ground, they actually believe that the Ukrainians have the Russians in a stalemate. And now that all this weaponry is going to come across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, that's going to help the Ukrainians rescue the day. This is all, you know, foolishness in, in the extreme. The weaponry is not going to matter hardly at all. And what matters is the casualty exchange ratio. And when you look at the casualty exchange ratio, it decisively favors the Russians and it's only getting worse. But I think people are ignoring that. And again, looking at movement on the ground where there hasn't been a lot of movement. Done but ground. you know, John, I mean, I, I can understand somebody who's who's not well versed in, in military theory or who doesn't understand even what ex, uh, uh, casualty exchange ratios are. Um, and if they're just looking at that line, they can go, yeah, it really hadn't moved much this year. I can see where they might think that. But we're talking about people who are supposed to know better. We're talking about generals and, and you know, people who are like secretaries of state and that kind of thing who should know that the, all the things you say to even some more granularity than maybe you and I have even talked about here. And yet you still see them going down this path. So I still remain puzzled. Well, I, I think I think, Danny, that most civilian policymakers in the West uh, have remarkably little knowledge of military affairs. Hardly any of them have ever served in the military. And even more importantly, hardly any of them have ever studied war. They've not studied military affairs. So in very important ways, they're babes in the woods. And the problem that you face when you talk about the military is that in most cases, the generals are subordinated to civilian policymakers in the various defense ministries around the world. The one possible exception to that at this point in time is, of course, uh, General Austin, who is the Secretary of Defense. But he's not a real Bolshevik. He's not the sort of person who's going to speak out uh, with an independent mind, which is, of course, why the Biden administration put him there. So you basically have a situation where there is hardly anyone at the top who's steeped in military affairs and willing to cut against the grain on this issue. And, you know, and speaking of, of Secretary Austin, 
uh, I don't remember if I've even mentioned this before, but when I was a, no, I was a Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, no, I was a major. I'm sorry. In my, when I was in Afghanistan, the first time, uh, I worked in, uh, primarily in, in the headquarters of CENTCOM central command, uh, where I was a liaison officer between combined forces command, Afghanistan, my headquarters and central command that was, uh, in Tampa and, and Doha and, uh, at several other places where I was at. And that was during the time when general Austin then was a two-star general and the chief of staff of CENTCOM. And, and, I got to watch him in these uh, twice daily briefings that we had during the time I was in the command center. And I wasn't real impressed with what I saw even back then and even less so now. Uh, but if he's the kind of guy that's going to, you know, get along to go along or go along to get along, then maybe that's why he's in this position. But here's how it's ram uh, rolling out right now. So I'm going to, in my view, this, uh, this whole problem that we have here starts at the very top. The U.S. government, led by the United States president, has to go. If you're going to go into a war, you have to have some kind of objective, some kind of strategy to go along with it. And I don't see it. And apparently we're not the only ones because in, in some congressional uh, testimony and Senate testimony here recently, uh, President Secretary Austin was asked, what is our plan? I mean, as far as an end game, do we see a uh peace settlement? Do we see outright victory? How long will it be before they come back to the well? We just did 61 billion. Uh, you know, there's been a lot more prior to that. Uh, what can we tell people? I mean, I, the president actually did try to explain this a little bit last week in response to the aid package. He was on TV or at least a visible press conference where he tried to describe it. We've been imploring the DOD and the administration to tell the American people why this is so important, why this investment is there. So what is, in your opinion, the end game timeline? When will it be needing more money? And you know, what's victory look like? As is the case with uh, most uh, conflicts of this type, uh, it ends in, with some sort of uh, uh, negotiation uh, and uh, and again, uh, if that happens, when that happens, uh, we want Ukraine to be in the best possible position to be able to to achieve uh, its goals uh, and and negotiate uh, uh, for for the right things. Okay, so now first of all, John, he answered none of the questions that the the representative asked, which were all great questions what's the end state look like? What's the strategy to get there? How much is it going to cost? When are we going to have to come back with some more money? And what does winning look like? He didn't even address that. And so I think that's your first problem right there. Well, he didn't provide answers because he has no answers. <laughs> there are no answers. What's the, what would you expect him to say? That, you know, we're going to do this and we have these resources to do it with, and that's going to produce victory in X or Y number of months. That's what you'd expect him to say, but he can't make that argument. So what he is doing is just sort of talking around the question. Well, and and and, and that, that was on the House side. On the Senate side, he was asked a similar question. Uh, at least the senator was a little bit more pressing on the issue here. But notice as we watch what he doesn't say here is how he struggles even to say nothing. So what does victory look like for Ukraine? Yeah. How do you define victory? You may have heard me say this earlier, Senator, but um, we've said from the very beginning that what we want to see is a Ukraine that's, uh, that's a, a democratic country that, has, uh, that, that, that is uh, independent uh, and, uh, and has the ability to protect its sovereign territory, to defend its sovereign territory, and to, 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 to deter aggression. Does that mean Crimea is part of Ukraine? Crimea is a part of Ukraine. Well, okay, yeah. right. But in order for the war to be over, does Ukraine have to control Crimea? In, in terms of how things transition uh, going forward, uh, you know, I, I would not uh, want to predict what President Zelensky will will decide. I but, think part uh, of the problem, with all due respect, is that this administration has not articulated what an exit strategy is. To me, this is a blank check for a war that without any clearly defined goals will be endless. Well, I mean, how can you argue with that last point that it, without any clearly defined goals, you don't even know what you're trying to accomplish, 
then of course it literally is by definition an open-ended con uh, conflict. And and that's it was good that he, he ended right there, but that's the problem. Then his time was over and he moved on to the next question, and, and that was the end of it. There's no follow-up. Nobody says, hang on a second. You're telling me that you're tying the United States to this to a war that could expand into potentially nuclear war if things go south, and you don't even know what we're trying to do? How come no one ever asked that follow-up question? I don't know. It's very hard to say <laughs> what's going on here. I would note to you that Jake Sullivan has recently said uh, that uh, the Ukrainians will hold this year, will get them all this equipment, and they're going to go on the counteroffensive in 2025. So if you think that uh, uh, Secretary Austin's comments are, are delusional or not satisfactory. Just think about what Jake Sullivan is saying. You really do wonder what planet that guy's living on. Uh, the Ukrainians will be lucky if they can last through 2024. The idea that they're going to go on the offensive in 2025, and this time, unlike in 2023, they're going to get to the Sea of Azov and break the Russian defenses, is, uh, is it fair to say it's laughable? It would be, I guess, if it wasn't so potentially catastrophic in its consequences for the Ukrainian people. Uh, but I wonder if you can touch on something here that that doesn't get much uh, airtime or press time. So, right. So once uh, prior to the signing of this ninety five billion dollar deal, you had all kinds of people in the United States uh, who were advocating this stuff, saying, you know, the only reason Ukraine's losing is because we haven't gotten them this money. Uh, so. Now that they've gotten the money, I hear lots of people say, well, all right, well, it kind of came late, so we'll see how it works out. But this will be enough to help stabilize the situation now. And maybe this is what uh, uh, the National Security Advisor is saying. We want to stabilize the thing now so that we can turn it around in 2025. But here's the first question I'd like you to answer is, based on what you've seen of what's in this package, and, and, and that includes the volume of it, is it enough to stabilize the situation? Well, the truth is that the administration has not stipulated the amounts of each kind of weaponry that are in the package. At least I haven't been able to find it. And most of the people I know who study this issue have not been able to find it. And I think the reason that the administration is not spelling out how many artillery pieces, how many artillery rounds they're going to be giving to the Ukrainians is because if people saw those numbers, they'd know that they're completely unsatisfactory for helping Ukraine, number one, stabilize the problem that they face on the front lines, and number two, go on the offensive in 2025. The fact is, we never had the weaponry on the shelf ready to give to the Ukrainians when there was this huge discussion about passing this aid package. The implication of all the comments that the administration and the war hawks made was that we had the weaponry and all we had to do was get congressional permission to take it off the shelf and ship it across the Atlantic Ocean. This was simply not true. Uh, and moreover, we have given the Ukrainians lots of our own equipment that we have to replace. As I like to point out to people, if you look at the $61 billion dollars that we're giving to the Ukrainians, uh, it's really not all 61 because 28 billion of that money is going to go to building weapons that replace uh, those weapons in the American inventory that have been given to the Ukrainians. That's 28 out of $61 billion is going to building weapons. For and, the yeah, and I believe there was an additional 13 point something, or maybe it was 14, that's going to U.S. European Command uh, to for our own operations. Not even that. So it has nothing to do with Ukraine. But uh, yeah, nobody, no one talks about that part either. And if I can make just one other point on this that's not to be underestimated, is that it seems that we're giving 10% of the artillery shells that we produce each month to the Israelis. If you look at what the Israelis are doing in Gaza and, and even up on the Lebanese border, um, it's quite clear that they have a real appetite, the Israelis, for artillery rounds, much the way the Ukrainians do. And as we all know, uh, from having talked about this issue over the months, that the United States is not producing that many artillery rounds. We don't have an industrial base that can be spun up to produce huge numbers of artillery rounds. And now we find out that the Israelis 
have a real appetite for those rounds, as well as the Ukrainians. So this makes the situation even worse. And and uh, if you could touch on the other issue that I, I know you've you've mentioned a number of times before, that almost irrelevant, irrespective of how much ammunition, how many tanks, artillery pieces, whatever you may come up with, the real, I guess, long pole in the tent sort of thing is the manpower issue. And that's what it seems to me that it, we, we can print $61 billion, we can manufacture some artillery shells, but you can't manufacture men. Yeah, there's no question about that. I mean, almost everybody agrees who's looked at this situation, including the Warhawks, that uh, Ukraine has a significant manpower problem. Uh, they have a significant number of people living in Ukraine who are of military age who refuse to serve in the military. They're basically draft dodgers. And then you have somewhere in the range, I would guess, of about a million uh, Ukrainians living in the European Union who are of draft age who are unwilling to come back. And the Ukrainian government, unsurprisingly, is putting pressure on EU governments to force those Ukrainians to come back so that they can be conscripted into the military. But that's not happening, and it's not going to happen. So the Ukrainians have no way of solving this desperate manpower situation. And there are now reports that they're sending police units and military cadets up to the front lines because they're oh, wow. so desperate for manpower. So you have this huge manpower problem on top of the weaponry problem. So now why don't I hear, at least not many, of the so-called American experts? I'm talking about general officers here. I'm going to give you a couple of examples in a second uh, that at least can say, hey, we need a lot more ammunition. This is something we should do, but you got to have trained soldiers and we got a big issue with that. At least say that the issue here. But instead we have like David Petraeus, uh, who just seemed to want forever wars. And, and in this case, he actually says it outright. Check this out. I was not one who believed that you had to actually end endless wars. Um, in fact, I, fought, I opposed the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Yes, it was frustrating. Yes, it was maddening. Yes, our partners in Kabul were not all that we might hope they would be. We only had 3,500 troops on the ground. We hadn't lost a soldier in a year and a half. There was no reason. We had $25 billion and an $850 billion defense budget. So we, we need to be careful about this. This one, we need to ensure that Ukraine prevails when, when this is over. No, asp, no com, uh, con, uh, explanation at all to who's going to be fighting with this stuff. And, and he just wants the war to go on for its sake. It was, it's telling, I think, that he's, he was lauding the Afghan model that we shouldn't have got out there because he said, why did we have to leave? Because we could have stayed with this amount of, uh, of troops. Not even talking about was it in our national interest? That didn't even enter the conversation. He just said because we could have stayed, we should have stayed. And that is so detached from any kind of reality. It's just mind boggling. Well, he was one of many generals who predicted the counteroffensive would be a great success. Uh, and even after the counteroffensive failed, he was still talking about all the opportunities that there would be for the Ukrainians to uh, defeat the Russians. Uh, so he's not somebody I take seriously. I mean, the fact is, Danny, if you want to be in the mainstream media and you want to be featured as a prominent uh, military officer, retired military officer, commenting on wars around the world, uh, there's a certain line of argument you have to make. And if you don't make that line of argument, uh, you won't appear on TV. If you make the kind of argument that you're making or I'm making now, you're unwelcome. And what they want on TV and the mainstream media are people like General Petraeus and assorted other retired generals who basically speak the party line. The problem here is that they're making arguments that are detached from reality. And the end result is that their predictions are almost always shown to be wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I could have pulled up uh, some of the quotes from uh, General Ben Hodges, who who also said that uh, famously in early 2023 that Ukraine would be in Crimea by August of that year, who also said it in July, even after it was evident that the whole operation was a complete and utter fiasco failure, 
uh, which had begun in June for to try to get down there. He still repeated that same claim. And yet today he's still giving frontline. You see him there on all the major news networks, both in the United States and in Europe. Uh, and I just don't get why no one ever pulls up those old clips and go, yeah, about this. Why is that? <laughs> well, again, there is a party line in the United States. There's a certain mantra uh, regarding Ukraine, uh, every dimension of the conflict. And if you challenge that uh, mantra, that conventional wisdom, uh, you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble and you're not going to be on television making lots of money like these retired generals are. It's just the way the American system works at this point in time. And uh, the end result, again, is that you get bad analysis because these people are not free uh, to speak their mind or to put it even differently. They don't bring people on TV who would challenge them. I would point out to you, by the way, Danny, that the one general who really stepped that line and made a smart argument uh, over the past um, two plus years since this war has been going on is General Milley in the fall of 2022, when he said now is the time uh, to settle this conflict. This is after the Ukrainians yeah. had done quite well on the battlefield in the battles over Kherson and uh, Kharkiv. He said, this is the high water mark. Let's cut a deal now. But you remember what happened to him. He was uh, shot down. He was told to basically keep his mouth closed and not to make arguments like that anymore because the White House was confident that they could or we could win the war. Uh, and Milley, of course, fell in line, which he is supposed to do because he is a military officer and the political leaders take precedence over the military leaders. But it just goes to show how difficult it is in, in the present uh, situation that we have here in the United States, and again, in the West more generally, uh, yeah. to make arguments that challenge the conventional wisdom. And the oh, probability of a Ukrainian military victory defined as kicking the Russians out of all of Ukraine to include what they define or what they claim as Crimea to the probability of that happening anytime soon is not high, militarily. Politically, there may be a political solution where politically the Russians withdraw. That's possible. You want to negotiate from a position of strength. Russia right now is on its back. The Russian military is suffering tremendously. Leaders have been uh, you know, the leadership is, is really hurting bad. They've lost a lot of casualties, killed and wounded. They've lost, uh, I won't go over exact numbers because they're, they're classified, but they've lost a tremendous amount of their tanks and their infantry fighting vehicles. They've lost a lot of their fourth and fifth generation fighters and, and helicopters and so on and so forth. The Russian military is really hurting bad. So you want to negotiate at a time when you're at your strength and your opponent is at weakness. And it's possible, maybe, that there'll be a political solution. All I'm, all I'm saying is there's a possibility for it. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, that, and that was that was one of the few, because I've, I've, I've taken issue with General Milley quite a few times, and that was one of the times when I agreed with him, and I thought he was right. But as you say, he got slapped down after that, and uh, then everybody seemed to fall in line, and no one wanted to talk reality for a while. Yeah, I mean, what, what else can you say? And uh I often wonder, Danny, what kind of uh, analysis is being done in, say, the CIA uh, or in the Pentagon by experts who are looking at the situation in places like Ukraine? What do they see and what are they telling their leaders? What are they telling the General Millies of the world, the General Browns, um, the Secretary of Defense, and so forth and so on? I would bet, not a lot of money, but I would bet that down below uh, in the CIA and in the uh, Defense Department, there are lots of people who understand what we're saying. And it's just that when their views, uh, you know, get pushed up to the top, they get put back in the closet or locked in the closet. Uh, and, you know, the high level officials uh, talk in, in very optimistic ways rather than in pessimistic ways. But I would guess that down below there has to be uh, 
there have to be a lot of people who just understand. Well, John, I can give you a couple of direct examples. Uh, I mean, you already know a lot of the stuff that I wrote about Afghanistan in 2012 while I was still on active duty after I got back from my last combat deployment there. Uh, and, and I can assure you a great many of the, the people I talked to knew exactly what the truth was, but it never was able to break through the top. But there was another example uh, from 2008 when I was with the Future Combat Systems, uh, and I recognized because I'd had armored combat experience and I knew that this new plan we were trying to get on was going to be a disaster if it ever actually got filled the way fielded the way that they were going to plan it out there. And I, and I literally I did everything by the book. I mean, I wrote memos. I wrote internal things. I talked to the to the senior members of the of the group or whatever. And, and it, it just got completely shot down. But all of the guys I was a major at the time who knew all the components of this system, why it was going to fail. Uh, no one was allowed to get up to the top. And, and this is a fact. I know that the, the chief of staff of the army at the time had a, had a meeting because one of my friends was in the meeting uh, and they knew all these testing things had failed. They knew it wasn't going to work. And they said, how can we keep Congress from knowing this? Otherwise they'll pull the plug on the program. We'll lose the money and we won't be able to go on forward. And so they devised a way to shield the results from Congress, even though they knew it didn't work because they wanted to keep trying. And so that's how all the people who, like me, who wrote stuff and said it wasn't going to work, they get blocked down. And the only thing that gets up is, yeah, it's working fine. Give me more money. They lied and it worked. Yeah, I mean, the logic here that underpins my thinking is that when you're in the military, there's a very high premium placed on being brutally frank about what the situation looks like, because you're talking about life and death situations. And in life and death situations, you want to know what the facts are to the best of your ability. And you want to analyze those facts in a fair and straight way. And the reason you do all this is it maximizes your chances of winning the war and not getting killed. And obviously, people have a very high incentive to do that if you're in uniform. So I would think that, you know, people down below who are studying these problems that you and I are now talking about basically see what we see. I mean, uh, it, it's kind of hard to miss it. But again, then what happens is it filters up to the top and the process that you described takes place. So, you know, if we're talking about like you were a minute ago about some people who are saying nonsense because they want to get on TV and, and they're more worried about being right. I can understand that a little bit. I disagree vehemently with it because of the consequences of it. But what do you say, John, when you have a situation like this where you have the secretary of state uh, saying some nonsense about how Ukraine will definitely join NATO? Check this out. Ukraine will become a member uh, of NATO. Uh, our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership uh, and uh, to create a clear pathway for, uh, for Ukraine uh, moving forward. Uh, we will see, I think, in the summit uh, very strong support for Ukraine going forward and its relationship with, uh, with NATO. What planet is anybody on? I mean, aside from the fact that nobody can join NATO if they're at war with somebody else, why would anybody want to have a nation that has an existing issue, even if that war was resolved with a nuclear power that could draw everybody into a nuclear war that's a non-winnable situation? Why do we say stuff like that? But I think, Danny, there's another very important point here, and that is that the more the Tony Blinkens of the world advocate uh, or promise that Ukraine will be brought into NATO, the greater the Russian incentive is to destroy Ukraine, because the Russians are profoundly committed to making sure that Ukraine does not join NATO. And the best way to prevent that from happening is to wreck the country. So what Tony Blinken is doing here is he is just encouraging the Russians to do further damage to Ukraine, or to put it in slightly different terms, to do greater damage to Ukraine. It's a remarkably foolish thing to say, and it's not going to happen. Ukraine is not going to be brought into NATO for the reasons that you elucidated and the reason that I elucidated. But if you talk about Tony Blinken, I've watched him more closely in the Middle East than I have with regard to Ukraine, and he is not a very 
good strategist. He is, to put it bluntly, not a very smart man. He may be good at taking exams and getting degrees from fancy schools, but when it comes to thinking in commonsensical ways about foreign policy and strategy, he's a second-class thinker. And the results show, both in the Middle East and with regard to Ukraine. Well, it looks like somebody else agrees with you. Gary, do you actually have that video of the, yeah, okay. Th this was somebody who worked for Blinken and talking about some of the same things she saw that you did. Check this out. I provided that critical feedback. I provided daily reports, for example, showing what pan-Arab media was covering in terms of the Gaza crisis, showing how there was growing anti-Americanism, which was an extremely concerning. And I was trying to raise this on a daily basis to Washington, explaining we need to change course. This is hurting our own national security interest if we maintain this policy. I was met with silencing. I was met with being sidelined. I was also met with, thank you for your critical feedback. This is going to the highest levels of our government. We had our, our messaging posture never has changed. We're still using the talking points directed to the Arab world, even if it's inflaming the tensions, even if it's instigating people across the region, hate us more and be more frustrated with us because they hear the double standard when we condemn an attack on Israeli interests, but we don't condemn the death of Palestinians. So that kind of gets to the question you asked a second ago about the Pentagon. Well, obviously the same thing is going on in the State Department that other people see the same thing you did about Blinken's leadership there. She tried to help him out, and instead they just shuttled her off to the side, and we continue on with the nonsense. No, well, there's lots of evidence that inside the State Department uh, that there is huge amounts of dissatisfaction with our Middle East policy. I would assume that the same is true inside the Pentagon as well. Uh, and with regard to Ukraine, I would assume that people in the State Department are uh, as aware of what's going on as you and I are, as are people in the Pentagon. I mean, the fact is that, you know, most people who work in the national security establishment are the deeply dedicated civil servants, uh, deeply dedicated military officers, uh, or deeply dedicated political appointees. And what they're trying to do is analyze the various situations that we face as best they can, and then prescribe really smart policies or policies that maximize our chances of succeeding. And uh, the problem, however, is that uh, policy is run from the top. And it's possible uh, that the people at the top can just ignore uh, all the dissenters or suppress the dissenters. And we have a rich history of this. I mean, going back to the Vietnam War. I mean, just think about George Ball. George Ball, who was a close confidant of LBJ, understood full well what the consequences were going to be of escalating uh, in Vietnam, putting large-scale ground forces in there. And he laid it all out. And uh, the Johnson administration, in particular the president, didn't want to hear what he had to say. And they told him to basically shut his mouth. And he shut his mouth and he fell in line. And the end result is we got into a disastrous war. But, you know, people at the top can suppress dissenters. They can, you know, create a situation where people down below, uh, the only people they hear down below are people who tell them what they want to hear. And when you're playing that game, you're almost guaranteed uh, to get decapitated. And by the way, we're in deep trouble in both Ukraine and, uh, Indeed. and the Middle East. We are really in deep trouble. And it's in large part <clears throat> because the leaders at the top uh, have not been willing to listen uh, to others, including people like that woman who we just heard speak. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm going to, because I, as I talked at the beginning of this, it's not just the West, it's also Zelensky who are not dealing with reality. And I'm going to go in there in a second. But I, I want to pause at that moment here and, and look at the other half of this equation, because I don't think we can look at this stuff without looking at the other side of the Russian side of this equation and, and their role in all this and, and where this can go. When you touched on it a second ago, you said when when they hear Blinken say those kinds of things like they're going to come into NATO, which was the reason that they went to war in the first place, that just makes them double down. But when when they hear these kinds of outlandish statements and, and, and especially on policies about what to do with this war, that he knows Putin, that these things are not connected to reality and that his military side and all the things that you and I talked about in New York, for example, they know that. What does this do to their actions uh, when they hear these kinds of things? Does it make them 
want to seek a negotiated settlement or, or as you said, does it make them want to, you know, press all the harder onto victory? My view is that the Russians think that we've lost our mind, right? And they don't think it matters whether you have Republicans or in, or Democrats uh, in office. They think the Americans are just, to put it crudely, they're out to lunch. And I think under those circumstances, they believe that what they have to do is that they have to win a significant victory in Ukraine. And they can't allow themselves to negotiate with the United States or with the West more generally uh, some sort of political settlement uh, that has the possibility of blowing back on Moscow, right? So they understand you can't trust the Americans. The Americans uh, say one thing one day and then change their mind the next day. So I think if you're going to get a deal in Ukraine, you're going to have to have the Ukrainians, number one, declare neutrality, no Ukraine and NATO. And furthermore, you're going to have to completely break the tie, the security link between the United States and Ukraine. Because as long as the security link between the United States and Ukraine exists, the Russians will never trust the Americans and the Ukrainians to keep to their end of a deal that ends the war. Okay, we'll see. Now that that is a little bit more concerning and troubling. In fact, when you say that they think they've that we've lost our minds and that they don't have any trust for us, that's just bad on the surface of it. But given that a, a few days ago Russia announced that they're going to conduct a non-strategic, i.e. tactical nuclear weapon exercise because, especially in light of what Lord Cameron said from the UK, that it's now okay for the Ukraine to start launching their weapons deep into Russia. Uh, this could spin out of control pretty quick if they actually took action on that. Well, I mean, what what, uh, what David Cameron said is one thing. You want to remember that Macron has been talking about putting French forces in there. And there's been all sorts of talk, although I don't think it's true, thankfully, about the French Foreign Legion entering Ukraine or maybe even being there now. It's not the case, I'm quite sure. But there's talk about that. This has spooked the Russians. And Hakeem Jeffries, who is the leader of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives, has basically said that if we lose in Ukraine, uh, we will end up fighting against the Russians. Uh, so the Russians think that they have to send a clear message to us uh, that there's a possibility that we'll end up in a nuclear war. So they're having these uh, sudden nuclear exercises. This just shows you. Is, it, is this just saber rattling or do you think they would actually consider using tactical nuclear weapons? Oh, I have no doubt in my mind that if they're involved in a war, uh, whether it's with Ukraine alone inside of Ukraine or with us inside of Ukraine, and they are losing, they will use nuclear weapons. Uh, I, I have never had any doubt about that. Uh, I can tell you how they would use them, and I think they would be quite effective. Uh, but you want to remember that they believe, the Russians believe, that what's going on inside of Ukraine is an existential threat to them. They believe that bringing Ukraine into NATO is an existential threat. They were willing to invade Ukraine in February 2022 over that issue. And now you're hypothesizing a situation where they're losing in Ukraine or where the West is fighting inside of Ukraine. I think it's hard to believe that they wouldn't use nuclear weapons to rescue the situation uh, if they were in trouble. Uh, so I think we're playing with fire here. And of course, I don't believe that we are going to introduce uh, NATO troops into Ukraine if the Ukrainians collapse for that very reason. But uh, we will certainly be tempted to do so. Yeah, now let me ask you that, because that, that, that brings up an, an, another point that hasn't been addressed at all. Uh, there has been consensus and actually a reflexive belief without any analysis that if the U.S. Or, or any of the NATO nations actually went to war with Russia conventionally, we'll say if it keeps there for the moment, well, of course, we would do a whole lot better than the Ukraine side here. But I'm not sure that that's right. And let's let's say that 
one of the things Macron speculated on about a week ago was that if Russia does break through their lines, he would consider, if asked, to send maybe 20,000 French troops in there. But I've got to wonder, French troops have no combat experience of any sort at all. And I'm just wondering if you put those guys in Ukraine, if they would do any better than the Ukraine side. Well, you'd need many more than 20,000 uh, troops. You'd need a good 100, 200,000 troops to rectify the situation. We're assuming a situation here where the Ukrainian army effectively collapses. So you have to get a couple hundred thousand troops up on the front line. And assuming you're not using nuclear weapons, you're going to need lots of tanks, lots of artillery, lots of artillery rounds. I don't think the French alone have that capability. Uh, and I don't think the Germans have that capability. So I think you'd have to bring in all of NATO or most of NATO, and you'd certainly have to bring in the Americans. Why don't you do this? You're in a great power war. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I, I must say, I find it hard to believe that we would fight, uh, we meaning the Americans, would fight a great power war over Ukraine. Ukraine is of little strategic significance to the United States. That's one of the truly... Uh, astonishing aspects of, of this war. Who controls Ukraine just doesn't matter. And if Ukraine were neutral, even if it was in uh, the Russian orbit, who cares? It just doesn't matter to the security of the United States. Okay, well, that, that raises, raises up another puzzling issue here. All right, so I'm, I'm about to show you something that uh, Zelensky said, I uh, believe it was just yesterday, or a couple of days ago, I'm sorry, uh, about what he wants from the United States and he's thinking he's going to get. But, well, actually, I'll let you play the, the clip first and then I'll, I'll talk about it on the backside. Our teams, Ukraine and the United States, are currently working on a bilateral security agreement and we are already working on a specific text. We are discussing the specific foundations of our security and cooperation. We are also working on fixing specific levels of support for this year and for the next 10 years. And, and then uh, uh, this was yesterday. So yesterday he's got this idea. And this is where you really get detached from reality that he wants to hold this peace summit without Russia, of course. And he wants all these people to come along. And he has any idea that somehow that's going to result in anything. Here's how he put it. Today I spoke with the leaders of Spain, Belgium, Latvia, Finland, and Cabo Verde. Step by step, we will establish a truly global community. Every continent will be represented at our summit in Switzerland, while Moscow is using the term multipolarity just hypocritically to cover its attempts to control the lives of other nations. We are creating a real tool for real multipolarity. We are inviting the world majority to the peace summit. Now, you've seen those two clips. So he's number one. He's thinking, yeah, this can go on another decade. I guess he listened to Petraeus on that. Uh, as you and I have discussed, I, I'm not sure they're going to get out of the summer without collapsing their military capacity. But he's still talking about a year. Now, then, with this other side, he's talking about somehow this anyone besides Russia is going to be able to end this for his side. And I don't even know what he's trying to get at. But here's my problem for the U.S., we can sit there and say that's just ludicrous. It's nonsense. But why do I keep seeing the U.S. say, well, Zelensky and Zelensky alone is going to be the determiner of what they do? You heard Austin say it. You've heard uh, several other American officials say it. Uh, Kirby has said it several times. Zelensky and Zelensky alone will determine these things. Why? Why are we allowing this guy who's making these kind of statements to establish American policy? We're not. It's just... Uh... <laughs> it's just the, I mean, the United States would never uh, delegate an important decision to Zelensky or, or to any other leader for that matter. We're a sovereign state. Not only are we a sovereign state, this is a sovereign state that is run by leaders who believe that we are the indispensable nation, who believe that we stand taller and who believe that we see further than any other country in the world. And we have no intention of letting anybody else tell us what to do. We're determined to run the world. That's basically what's going on here. And uh, we, uh, if anything, run Zelensky. He doesn't run us, and that's not going to change. Well, then, then why would we want to keep saying that stuff if it's not? Because if that would then imply that, well, it's actually okay with us. We want him to go down that path. 
where is the benefit to that? Because I, I just don't see how this benefits us in, in any way, because and unless your comment earlier that there is this fantasy belief that a miracle could happen short of that, what's the play for our side? Well, what it does is it allows us in a very subtle way to distance ourselves from Ukraine. In other words, if things go south, we can say he's in charge. We advised him. We helped him. But ultimately, it was up to Ukraine to figure out what to do on the battlefield, what to do diplomatically, and so forth and so on. You know, when you talk about the uh, peace negotiations that uh, took place um, in uh, Istanbul right after the war broke out, uh, we like to make the argument that it was Zelensky who walked away. It wasn't Boris Johnson uh, and President Biden who basically told Zelensky to walk because we thought we could win the war. No, it was Zelensky who, because of X or Y or Z decided this was going nowhere and he walked away. We want to show that the Ukrainians have independence and that these are sovereign states that are operating together against the Russians. But of course, that's not true. Uh, Zelensky has been uh, you know, pushed in all sorts of ways by the West, especially by the United States, even before this war started. And really, just to, uh, to to bolster your position there, as uh, uh, Gary was able to dig up a comment from the president saying nearly exactly what you said, here's how he put it. We don't walk away from our allies. We stand with them. We don't let tyrants win. We oppose them. We don't merely watch global events unfold. We shape them. That's what it means to be the ins indispensable nation. That's what it means to be the world's superpower and the world's leading democracy. But this vote makes it clear. There is a bipartisan consensus for that kind of American leadership. That's exactly what we'll continue to deliver. It, 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 that's what we'll continue to deliver. We don't deliver that as it is. That's just an aspirational fantasy, but yet that's that animates. That's why I said at the beginning, it starts at the top. And when you have that kind of mentality, then you see all this other nonsense. But I, I think, John, and I've heard you mention this before, you can have that aspiration, but if you can't back it up, if you can't produce it on the ground, I mean, you're just setting yourself up for disaster. Yeah, it's very important to emphasize that Biden's uh, worldview is not anomalous uh, inside the American foreign policy establishment. It, it's widely accepted. And anybody who challenges that view is basically considered unpatriotic or delusional for not understanding that we are the United States of America. But the problem when you have that view is that, number one, it encourages you to intervene in the politics of every country on the planet because you think you know what's best for everybody. <laughs> and furthermore, it gives you no sense of the limits of power. When you listen to Joe Biden talk, and again, he's not the only one. Uh, it was true of Madeleine Albright when she first articulated right. this line of argument. Uh, these are people who just think America is so powerful, it can do pretty much everything it wants. And therefore, if it intervenes in the politics of another country, which it's prone to do for the reasons I just described, it's all going to work out for the good. But the problem is that if you look at American foreign policy since the Cold War ended throughout the 1990s and into this 21st century that we're now living in, the United States' track record is abysmal. It's really horrible. It's quite amazing uh, how the indispensable nation has performed uh, around the world over those, let's say, 35 years. We've just really done a terrible job. And, uh, and a lot of it just has to do with this hubris that you find at the top. We're the United States of America, for God's sake. The most powerful nation in the history, not in the world, in the history of the world. The history of the world. That says it all. I mean, right. I, you know, that sums up what I was saying perfectly. It it, it does, and but and if we can laugh about it a little bit, but I, I mean that is deeply troubling to me because this can get us into real trouble that we might have a problem getting out of. And the last thing I want to show you here, I know we're running low on time. Uh, there was an article in Politico earlier today where another retired general, uh, General Kimmett. 
uh, is saying that, you know, how the West is helping Ukraine won't be enough to win. And you might think just from the headline is that he might be saying something similar to us, but he's not. When you look into it deeper, he actually wants to to get us in deeper. He says a congressional supplemental was necessary, but it's not enough to reverse the deteriorating situation in Ukraine. It's time to loosen the handcuffs we placed on Zelensky and let him use the weapons and equipment we provided. It's time to take risk with our own wartime stockpiles. And elsewhere in the articles, he said that we should not be worried about getting rid of our, uh, you know, going below the minimum thresholds for our own stocks if we should need them. Not sure how that works out in his mind, but then he says we should give Zelensky and his soldiers everything that they need or want. It's time to take the gloves off because failure in Ukraine could encourage the very war our soldiers in places like Korea stand ready to fight. And then, of course, all these other cascading things. Somehow that's going to make China want to attack Taiwan. But I, I think it's the exact opposite. If we do the things that he suggested, if we act in the ways that Biden is suggesting with his mentality there, I think that we're going to end up causing wars that we want to stop because, and I think you've even said this a few times with the Russian situation, they didn't want to go to war here, but we kept making these, you know, advancements of the military uh, alliance up to their border. And then they felt like apparently that they had no choice. This is the sunk costs argument. You know, we have these sunk costs and people just can't walk away from this. I want to make a general point, Danny, that has a lot of relevance, I think, for this issue. Uh, what we've done over time in terms of building up uh, our stockpile of weaponry is we have emphasized quality over quantity. It's very clear that the Russians have emphasized quantity over quality. So we have lots of boutique weapons, not many of them, but they're really quite fancy and they're designed to be very effective. If you look at what's happened in terms of the performance of these boutique weapons uh, like HIMARS, uh, uh, and these ground yeah. full-diameter missiles yeah. uh, in Ukraine, what you see is that our boutique weapons have been countered by the Russians after very short periods of time. Uh, there was an article recently in Newsweek. This is a quite amazing article. It said the Ukrainians are looking to maximize their use of the ATACMS missiles in the next couple months because they expect that the Russians will figure out uh, a successful counter to the ATACMs by that point in time, and they'll be largely effective. So what you see is lots of these fancy weapons that we've given to the Russians have turned out to be ineffective once the Russians figure out what the countermeasures are uh, to thwart them. And they do figure out what the countermeasures are. So what the lesson one walks away from all of this with is that quantity is very important. You want to have an industrial base that can pump out lots of artillery rounds. You don't need fancy artillery rounds. You just need lots of basic artillery rounds. Quantity matters. And we like to think, and we used to think this during the Cold War, I remember very well, that our qualitative advantage could shut down their quantitative advantage. Well, what we're seeing in Ukraine is that our qualitative advantage isn't of much use, and we really need quantity, and we well, don't have quantity. But, you know, I, I think during the Cold War, at least while I was serving in, in that part, but we had qualitative advantage, but we also had a lot of it. So if, if Russia had this much, maybe we had this much, but ours was a lot better. But now that it's like way down like this, and, and so we have a real problem. Yeah, I think there's no question about that. I mean, the Cold War, not to get into too much history here, but the Cold War was an extension of World War II, and World War II was a war where quantity mattered, period. Uh, and in fact, the Germans suffered from the fact that they uh, tended to emphasize boutique weapons, especially with regard to building tanks, whereas the Russians just pumped out, or the Soviets. Right, right, right. T-34 after T-34, and of course, the Americans had an assembly line industrial base as well. So the Cold War, you're correct, right, was one where quantity mattered. But nevertheless, we always felt that we couldn't match Soviet quantity. And where we had an advantage was in the quality of our weapons. And this is really carried over into the post-Cold War period. But what we're seeing in Ukraine is that we have been thinking about this all wrong. And what you really need are lots of simple weapons and buying, you know, small numbers of sophisticated weapons doesn't solve the problem. 
There's one additional point that needs to be made here, Danny, and that is that in a war of attrition, where people are being killed in large numbers and you're constantly bringing in new troops, when you bring in new troops, you want them to have simple weapons that they can use, and you want them to have lots of simple weapons. And if you have boutique weapons that take lots of training to use and you're bringing in new troops, there's going to be a mismatch there, and it's going to get you That's such a, good point. a lot of trouble. Uh, yeah, that is such a good point. I mean, I, I've just got my own experience of that, how, how, how hard it is to learn something that's got really sophisticated uh, as opposed to something that's simply you can use it like in 48 hours or something like that. Uh, in the last few minutes we have here, I want to ask you two separate questions. Uh, the first one has, I think, the possibility of more optimism than the second one, but I'll ask that one first. Uh, what would you do if, if the White House came to you right now and said, uh, you know, John, we have boxed ourselves into a corner here. We've been saying all these statements for all this long. Now I don't know how to get out of this, but we see the ground truth that you keep talking about here. What should we do right now, now that we've given this $61 billion, all the mess that's happened, how can we take this mess right now and get it fixed so that we can have some kind of an, an, an outcome that's at least positive? Well, there's only one possible solution. And I want to underline the word possible because it's not clear it would work, but it's the only game in town, in my opinion. And that is we do everything we can to shut down the war immediately. Uh, and we go to great lengths to create a neutral Ukraine. Uh, we get the Ukrainians to make it clear to the Russians that they have no intention of joining NATO. They will be a neutral state and they will go to great lengths not to pursue a security policy that threatens Russia in any way. And then the second thing that needs to be done, as I said before, is that the security relationship between the United States and Ukraine has to be completely ended. Uh, the Russians have to see that Ukraine is independent, clearly independent of the United States. Uh, if you create a situation like that, I believe the Russians will see much less of a threat from Ukraine than they do today. And you may be able to get... Um, uh, the Russians to work out some sort of deal where they don't take much more territory in Ukraine. And of course, more Ukrainians don't end up getting killed. But uh, I think that is the only hope we have. And if we don't pursue it and we continue to operate on this illusion that you see reflected in the comments of people like Jake Sullivan and General Petraeus, uh, that this war is winnable over the long term. The end result is many more Ukrainians are going to die and the country is going to be even more wrecked than it has already been wrecked and more territory is going to be lost to the Russians. And, and would it be fair to say that in that scenario that to, to avoid the even the, the charge of, oh, you're just being weak and you're capitulating, to simultaneously say, but we're going to continue to, to beef up the eastern flank of NATO. So you still can't come one inch into NATO, blah, blah, blah. We're not going away. We're just not going to go down a stupid path. Is that fair? I wouldn't do that. Uh, I, I'd actually back off in Eastern Europe. I'd do everything I can to assuage Russian fears. I mean, if you're interested in shutting this one down, if you pull out of Ukraine, you basically sever the ties with Ukraine and then you greatly increase NATO forces uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and you want to remember that a number of those states uh, are right up on Russia's border. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're, I think, asking for trouble. You're going to scare the Russians. Uh, the Russians don't trust us. That's what's very important to understand. Yeah. Putin believed that he made a fundamental mistake thinking that the West was negotiating in good faith with him in the past. And he's not going to be played for a sucker again. Given that mindset, right, you have to do everything possible to assuage his fears. You may not like that. And I can fully understand why no Western leader would want to hear that. But the fact is, he's holding all the cards now. We are not. We are in desperate straits. So we are the ones who have to make concessions. Yeah. And so do you, well, first of all, just to kind of validate what you said there for, for our, some of our viewers who may not know, uh, here's something that Putin recently said uh, that shows his contempt for the West. 
Ну, сейчас тоже Ширака нет, Жака Ширака. Он был крупным таким политическим деятелем. Я как-то его спросил, почему американское руководство так себя ведет? Ну, так агрессивно и, и так недальновидно действует в некоторых случаях. Он мне по-русски, по-русски ответил, потому что не культурные. So he obviously, you know, has contempt. And I guess, you know, if you're talking, we can just limit it to like the, the Minsk Accords, which we now know that the West never intended to follow or Istanbul, which didn't happen. And so you can see why he wouldn't feel that way. Uh, so I guess kind of, I, I mean, I, I was I was trying to give an olive leaf to the West to say, well, get out of Ukraine, but you can even go through the fiction of keeping the border tight. But I guess that's even not going to do it because if if I'm not mistaken, Russia had a million active forces in October. I'm sorry, in February of 2022, and they've now expanded that to 1.5 million uh, as a permanent state, not just for this war, at least according to what they're saying. So uh, I, obviously, they they want some hedge on where or not they trust the West. I guess. Well, it's very important to understand that the Baltic states, um, Romania, Poland, Hungary, these countries. Uh, which are effectively frontline states, are all in NATO, and they all have Article 5 guarantees. And that should not change at all. And that will do a great deal to deter the Russians from ever attacking those countries. Uh, and I am not saying for one second, given that NATO is intact, uh, that we should abandon those countries. My point is that we don't want to be provocative towards the Russians in their efforts to defend those countries at this point in time for the sake of Ukraine. We want to do everything possible to save Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine and is never going to be go wrong, but didn't you say something like that in 2015? Didn't you make a recommendation like that back then? 2014. 2014. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. If we had listened then, it would have been good. And that was my that, that tails into my last question, which may not be quite as optimistic. Do you see anybody, anybody on the horizon politically that might have the capacity or the courage to make such a choice, whether it's Trump or Biden or JF, RFK or, I don't know, Jill Stein? I mean, is there anybody? Well, someone like Jill Stein or RFK, they're not going to get elected. It's a question at this point in time uh, of whether it'll be Biden or Trump. Uh, and uh, Biden is certainly not going to move in that direction. Uh, he's a quite, uh, he's quite, you know, dedicated to supporting the present policy. Uh, which he created towards Ukraine. And an election is coming up in November. I don't see him changing gears. I mean, Putin, uh, not Putin, Trump may uh, have some interest in going down a different road. He talks that way. Uh, but, you know, Trump talked that way in 2016. Uh, and after he moved in the White House, he tried to improve relations with the Russians, but it all failed. So it's not clear that he can do anything different than Biden is doing. The foreign policy consensus on Ukraine is just, it's airtight at the top. Uh, it just cuts right across party lines. Uh, and it's very hard to see how you change that. Uh, I mean, the Trump people will tell you that this time is going to be different if he gets elected. They learned their lesson last time. And he'll deal with NATO appropriately. He'll deal with Ukraine appropriately. He'll deal with those issues in ways that he couldn't between 2017 and 2021 when he was in the White House. Uh, I have my doubts about that. Uh, I, I think the foreign policy establishment or the deep state has roots that are so deep that even Donald Trump will be unable uh, to change things. But maybe I'll be wrong, proved wrong. Well, let's let's certainly hope so. I mean, we'll we'll find out because it just it, reelecting the same crew that's making these horrific decisions now does not uh, invite a lot of confidence going through. But you know, all we can do is we can say the truth. We can keep putting it out there like we're doing here. We can tell the people what's real, what the ground truth is showing, and and you know, show all these evidence that that you keep bringing up and and the logic that you've been saying for decades. And, and maybe at some point enough people will see this and the demand changes from this, uh, from the foreign policy establishment. That's the, that's maybe the one hope we have. I think Danny, when you get right down to it, uh, the only thing that's really going to change this situation 
is if the Ukrainian military collapses uh, and the Russians win a significant victory. Uh, that, that will change the nature of the game. Uh, that, that, that is ironic and perverse that we have to hope for all of our sakes, and that includes the Ukrainians in the western part of the country, that their army collapses, which basically could bail us out of having to make any more bad decisions. But uh, that does seem to be where we are. We're in trouble. <laughs> well, and well, on that very optimistic point, we'll, uh, we'll bring this one to a close. Thank you so much for coming on today, though. And even though it's it's kind of ugly sometimes, it's it's really useful and helpful to have you come and provide such clarity at the strategic level, uh, all the way down to the tactical level about what's going on here. So that at least we know what we're facing. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Danny. And and we appreciate you too. We always value you guys coming on. Uh, and, and, and making these comments that you see in there. We try to put a lot of them up there, but uh, I appreciate you guys talking to each other too as well. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already to our channel. Uh, that helps us uh, get more of an of a, of a audience because the, uh, the uh, algorithms on YouTube respond to that kind of thing. And when they see that more people liking it, then more people get to see the truth on shows like this. So we thank you for that. And we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.